It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Good morning, Speaker. Uh, this question is for the Premier. The hardworking people of Ontario have invested in this province. They expect to see a government that will invest in them. But yesterday's fall economic statement makes it very clear that people are not getting what they paid for. Housing starts are down. Transit projects are delayed. Health care waits are increasing. And the cost of living wasn't even worth a mention in their book. If this government is not building homes or getting people the medical care when they need it and can't even get gauze to home care patients, has this government not failed the people of this province? Members will please take their seats. And to reply, the Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, uh, through you to the member opposite, uh, you know, I, I just heard that uh, she said that the cost of living wasn't addressed. Where have you been since day one? This government has been putting money back in the pockets of people since day one, Mr. Speaker. You know, let's start with the gas tax. We provided relief at the pumps, the license plate stickers, relief there. You know, it was that government, uh, Liberal government supported by the NDP that put the tolls on the 412 and the 418, Mr. Speaker. You know, this is a government that has been helping people putting money back in their pockets, Mr. Speaker. It's that opposition party, along with the Liberals, for 15 years. They had their hands in the pockets of people taking money out. It's this government that's putting money back in their pockets. Supplementary question. Speaker, where has this minister been? Right? The economic Order. update speaks Order. for itself, Speaker. Order. Unemployment is up. Check your own numbers. Rent, housing costs skyrocketing. Ontario is once again forced to go cap in hand to Justin Trudeau for equalization payments. Shameful. This province was once the economic engine of Canada. Look at where we are now, under this government's watch. Back to the government Premier side, again. Come to if this government, government is side, not come building to homes and not fixing schools and not hiring doctors, what are you doing? Members, please take their seats. Remind the members to make their comments through the chair. The Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I can't believe what I'm hearing. Yeah, I really, I mean, I know it's Halloween. I, I just don't get what. Are they tricking us? Who is that person? Order. You know, Mr. Speaker, 15 years, what did we say, see in the economy? We saw the tail lights of 300,000 manufacturing jobs leave for the U.S. Mr. Speaker, under this Premier, under this government, and all of us here, we're rebuilding that economy. Jobs are coming back. To Ontario, we're leading. If we were a country, we would be leading the G20, and we would be that big to be in the G20, leading economic growth, bringing prosperity right across Ontario. I don't know which province the member opposite is living in, but this is a province that's created almost 200,000 new jobs just this Response? year, Mr. Speaker. You know, the sun is rising again in that uh, province, uh, uh, an economic engine, that province called Ontario. It's sunny days again. The final supplementary. Taking a lesson from their buddy Justin Trudeau once again, eh? Look at that. Look at that. Order. That tells you a lot. Listen, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, Speaker, what they've been doing, yeah. right? Building luxury spas yeah. in downtown Toronto that nobody wanted. <laughs> Fighting nurses and education workers in court to nickel and dime them. Hemorrhaging public dollars to private health care companies. Order. And they are under criminal investigation by the RCMP for their Greenbelt scandal that, and let me say, Speaker, that scheme didn't build a single home in the province of Ontario. What a waste of space. If you can't deliver on the basic responsibilities of a government, then do you not think maybe it's Order. time you got out of the way? <laughs> 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 
their seat. Order. Government side, come to order. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, they're using the same old tired line, same old, same old, same old. You know, in the meantime, we understand that the cost of living for many people in this province, they're struggling with grocery prices, the cost of gas, the cost of housing and other costs, and that's why. Because of the tax revenues and because of our stewardship of the economy and the fiscal situation, we're able to put that growth in revenues back into the pockets of the people of Ontario. That's why we're giving a $200 tax rebate. Opposition a, family. a family of five will get $1,000. Think about that, to help with those groceries, to help with those travel costs and maybe be able to afford a little bit more over the holiday period. Mr. Speaker, this is a government that has been working Response. money back into the hard-working hands of the people of Ontario. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, that first of all, that affordability crisis, that skyrocketing cost of living, that's this government's legacy. That's this government's legacy after six years in power, six long years. I want to dig a little bit more into this government's record. With this government and this premier, Ontarians, as I said, are not getting what they paid for. While Ontarians are stuck in the same place at the end of each month, the best that this premier and this government can offer are stale ideas and empty promises. Let's look at housing. In yesterday's fiscal update, here's what we learned. Housing starts down. Housing targets out of reach. Housing crisis gets worse by the day. Mortgage payments, loan payments, down payments. Speaker, can this government explain to Ontarians why housing is no longer a priority for their government? Members, please take their seats. To reply, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Just for a second, let's just unpack what she just said. She talked about the skyrocketing cost of, of, uh, of mortgage prices. Now, why do we have skyrocketing uh, mortgage uh, prices across the province of Ontario and across the country? Because the Liberal and NDP coalition in Ottawa, the tax and spend policies led to Order. higher interest rates, Order. Mr. Speaker, because inflation went through the roof. It's the same policies that that crew put in place here in the province of Ontario that have put us in crisis that we have been unraveling year after year after year. Year. Order. The interest rate increases were the fastest increases in the, in the shortest amount of time in the history of the country. And it was this Premier who took to the microphone and called order. on the federal government to do its part Opposition and reduce those interest order. rates. And you know what the underlying theme was, Mr. Speaker? The NDP continued to prop up another failed Liberal government when they could have taken them down like they could have in Ontario, ended the misery and brought a good, strong, stable Conservative government. Stop the clock. <laughs> Order. It's getting increasingly noisy in here. I'm asking both sides of the house to come to order. I'm going to start calling members out individually, if need be, to maintain order in this house as we continue with question period. Order. Start the clock. Supplementary question. Speaker, and look, you don't have to take it from me. You have to just look at the government's own fiscal update, your own update. Housing starts are down. They are nowhere near meeting their own targets. One and a half million homes by 2031 is a pipe dream. Housing starts down. Housing targets out of reach. Housing crisis worse by the day. Six years wasted. Task force recommendations ignored. Speaker, when will this Premier finally say yes to making housing more affordable, yes to our Homes Ontario plan, and yes to getting people in Ontario the help that they need? Members will please take their seats. The member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke will come to order. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing can reply. 
clear, Mr. Speaker. Before the rapid increase in interest rates that were brought on by the high inflation policies of the Liberal and NDP coalition in Ottawa, we were building more homes than ever before in recorded history of the province. And not just single detached homes, but purpose-built rentals. Purpose-built rentals. Interest rates increased, and you know what happened? The people who build communities had to put their shovels down. The people who wanted to buy their first home couldn't afford to buy their first home. This Premier stood up and said, the interest rates have to come down, Mr. Speaker, and now we're finally starting to see it come down while we're continuing to work to unravel the mess that they left behind. But I'm sure Canadians and Ontarians have such comfort. The NDP want to start the NDP home building contracting company. For $150 billion, you can get a home built Fox. by the leader of the opposition, Mr. Speaker. A recipe for disaster. Nobody wants it. But I challenge you, bring down the federal government. Let's get the economy moving across Canada. I will remind the House to make their comments to make their comments through the chair. The member for Ottawa South, no, sorry, Ottawa Centre will come to order. The member for Don Valley East will come to order. The Associate Minister for Energy Intensive Industries will come to order. Start the clock. The final supplementary. In the words of the great Eminem, will the real, real Premier of Ontario please stand up? Please stand up. These answers do not change the facts. These answers do not change Government the facts. Government side, come to order. Housing starts are down. Order. Costs are up. But instead of doing his job, the Premier keeps blaming everyone but himself. Here are three things that this Premier could do right away to build more homes. Allow fourplexes, increase density near transit, and yes, say yes to building truly affordable homes in the province of Ontario. Support our Homes Ontario plan. Speaker, will the Premier finally do his job and build the homes that people are waiting for? Second, just one second. Just one second. Just premier, premier, premier. Just one second. Just one second. Just one second. The Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development will come to order. The Minister of Red Tape Production will come to order. The Government House Leader will come to order. We will now start the clock. The Premier can reply. Well, sorry, Mr. Speaker, I couldn't hear you from all the cackling on the other side there, but you know, you just took a hat trick away from my good friend, uh, Minister Calandra, and I can tell you one thing. I just heard you say, every, everyone was shouting and screaming, I thought you said build density on top of the TOCs on transit. You voted against that. You voted against that when our infrastructure minister and minister of housing put that forward. Order. So you may have to read your book again. You voted, ag you voted against making sure we did the BFF building faster fund. You voted against that, that we were giving, giving uh, municipalities across the province targets to hit and gave hundreds of millions of dollars away from them. You voted against the highways and the roads that are going to get people to these new communities. You voted against the GO train that are going to new communities. Order. You voted against the largest Response. transit project in North America to get people there until we can build condos on top of these stations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Stop the clock. The Premier will take his seat. The Premier will take his seat. Centre will come to order. The member for St. Catharines. 
The Premier will come to order. We can start the clock again. Member for Kiwetan. Uh, Miigwech, uh, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. The crisis in health care, housing, affordability experienced right across the province is magnified in the north, especially for First Nations. The fall economic statement is not meant for people living in northern Ontario. Does the Premier think he's done enough for the people in the north with this fall economic statement? Minister of Finance. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Through you, I thank the question, a uh, very serious question to, uh, to the member opposite. You know, Mr. Speaker, since day one, this government has opened up the North and supported the North like we haven't seen for decades. Here, here. As my uh, distinguished colleague, the Minister of Mines, mentioned to me that in 1996, the population in the North peaked. And you know what's happening now under this government? Population now is starting to grow again in the North because they're seeing support. They're seeing support like they've never seen. In fact, uh, the Premier was just up in Sudbury announcing a wastewater infrastructure investment to help build 3,300 new homes in Sudbury. Population of 15,000. You know, we just announced yesterday in the fall economic st statement an increase, a $100 million increase to the Ontario Municipal Partnership Response. Fund wow. to help 320 northern, small and rural communities in the north. And in fact... Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Miigwech, uh, Speaker. I know they may be opening up the north, but there's still a crisis that's happening in the north. I was just in a, uh, a community over the weekend. I, it's unbelievable when you see three caskets in a church. So there's a crisis happening. But I want to say this, Speaker. Uh, back in 2018, the Premier promised to build a much-needed 76 long-term care beds in Sulicote. And in May, the, the Premier again promised to get it done. But yesterday's fall economic statement does not deliver the new long-term care beds for the elders that who have been waiting. I ask again, Speaker, when will this government provide the long-term care overdue, the long-term overdue beds at, uh, in Sulico? Members, please take their seats. Again, the Minister of Finance. Well, thank you. Uh, through you again, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member uh, and acknowledge the member opposite for agreeing with us that we're opening up the north. Long overdue, but it's this government that is getting it done. Mr. Speaker, if we just think of some of the things like the mobile crisis unit, the increased funding in Thunder Bay that we just announced. You know, Mr. Speaker, if you think about the Northern Travel Grant, an increase to 45 million helping for health care in the north. If you think about the homelessness prevention Order. program, that we increased by 40 percent, which benefits many of the communities in the north. And, Mr. Speaker, just last week, the Premier and the Minister of Health and I were privileged to announce the Learn and Stay program for medical students, students who study in Thunder Bay and Sudbury and many parts of the north. If they stay in those communities, we'll pay their medical tuition and expenses Response. for them. And this is a game changer for many medical students. 7,300 medical students, Mr. Speaker. We we're doing a lot for the North, and we're going to continue to build the prosperity in the North. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We've heard loud and clear from people all over the province that due to the Trudeau Crombie carbon tax, which is truly scary, life is just too expensive. When they go to the grocery store, they're feeling the pinch. When they go to fill up on gas, they're feeling the pinch. When they pay their mortgages and their bills, they're feeling the pinch. That is not right, Mr. Speaker. In Ontario, people should be optimistic. Speaker, can the Minister of Finance please explain more about what our government can do to support Ontarians at a time when the price of everything is being driven up by the scary Trudeau-Crombie carbon tax? 
Minister of Finance. Well, I heard a boo. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you to the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you for that question. Where are you? You're, you're over there now. Okay, well, thank you for that question. You know, you know, I think about this carbon tax. You just mentioned the carbon tax. You know, we cut the gas tax. We're providing a relief at the pumps, you know, the gas prices, fuel and diesel for our truckers, the 5.3 cents for them. You know, this is really having an impact on the people who move the foods, uh, the groceries, the goods right across province. And do you know what's happening in the support of that NDP party and that Liberal party up in Ottawa? They're increasing that tax again in April, Mr. Speaker. So one group of parties have their hand in your pocket trying to take money out and make life more difficult. And there's another party, a party, the Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario, that is putting money back in the hardworking pockets of the people of Ontario. I again, remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Every day, Ontarians are feeling the financial squeeze due to the truly scary Trudeau Crombie carbon tax. Groceries are more expensive, monthly bills are tougher to manage, and high inflation is stretching people's budgets. And the Trudeau Crombie carbon tax, as the minister said, is only making things worse. Families in my riding and across Ontario are feeling the impact, and it's becoming harder just to get by. Speaker, we know that our government is working hard to keep life affordable, but with all these pressures, people are looking for more help. Speaker, can the minister please tell us how the government is helping Ontarians cope with the high cost of living by putting more money, more of their money, back into their pockets? Again, Minister of Finance. Oh, thank you again, Mr. Speaker. Thank you again to the member for that question from Eglinton Lawrence. You know, Mr. Speaker, let's, let's do a little compare and contrast. So uh, when they were in power for 15 years, uh, who put the tolls on the 412 and the 418? Uh, NDP, NDP Liberals. NDP Liberals. Liberals. Who increased the wine tax and the beer tax? The Liberals. The Liberals. Liberals. Who increased the driver's license fees? <laughs> Who increased the employer health tax? Do you remember that one? I'm not going to raise any taxes. And they did that on almost on day one. Now help me out here, Mr. Speaker. Who cut the gas tax? We did. Who cut the beer tax and froze the beer tax? We did. And the member from Niagara, who cut the wine tax? We did. Yeah, we did. Absolutely. Who cut the tolls on the 412 and the 418? We did. You're welcome. And who's going to keep cutting taxes and putting fees and money back in the pockets of the hardworking people on Ontario? We are. We are. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My, my question is for the Premier. Speaker, uh, there's been a lot of talk and so much talk about housing in this House, but very, very little action. Uh, the lack of affordable housing in Ontario is a humanitarian crisis, and based on this fall economic statement, this government has pretty much given up on addressing this crisis. Housing starts are down again. The government has cut its own target to 81,000 homes, which is nowhere near the predicted 125,000 homes. Uh, and they'll never hit the target of 1.5 million at this rate. To make matters worse, uh, the government hasn't even tried to access the federal $250 million uh, that they put on the table to work with provinces to address encampments. Those encampments have, ex has ex have exploded, actually, in our ridings across the province. Uh, no, they're not even willing to address this crisis around, uh, around homelessness. So to the Premier, Question. when will the government correct its failed course and focus on building truly attainable, affordable housing and, and start leading for the people of this province? Here, here. Response, the Premier. Mr. Speaker, we led the charge on removing the HST for purpose-built rentals, Mr. Speaker. We eliminated making sure that we invested, I should say, over $3 billion in new funding for municipalities to help funding housing enabling infrastructure fund. Yep. This includes $1.2 billion in funding for those who meet the exceeded housing targets, Mr. Speaker. We expanded 
and that by giving $120 million to small rural northern municipalities that have not been assigned housing targets already. We've invested over $42 million to help enroll approximately 5,100 new households into Canada-Ontario Housing Benefit Program, better known as the COHP program, this year. This is on top of the 22,700 households already receiving the COHP Response. benefits as of March 31st, 2024, Mr. Speaker. They voted against every one of those bills. Supplementary question. Speaker. In fact, this is a government that is running from the RCMP all the way into an early election. That's what this Premier's focus has been on. And, and listen, Speaker, by their own figures, this government is failing. It can't hit its own targets. In fact, it's actually making life worse for Ontarians. 30,000 children are on a wait list for mental health. 83,000 children are waiting for autism services. 234,000 homeless people in this province. That is your record. And it's a painful reminder, I think, of how lost this government is. But it's Ontarians who are paying the price. Instead of real solutions, we get a $200 check scheme uh, costing $3 billion, Speaker. Uh, I have to say, this is money that is so needed in health care and education. And it will undoubtedly go as well as the LCBO paper bag debacle, quite honestly. Endless scandals, scams, beer promises, this is what we get from this government under a criminal investigation by the RCMP. When can Ontarians expect a government that will show up for them and work for them instead of yourselves? Members, so please take your seat. I'm going to ask the member for Waterloo to withdraw the unparliamentary comment. Thank you. The tea will come to order. To reply, the Minister of Missile Affairs and Housing. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, look, Mr. Speaker, it really it, it shows. The, the inadequacy really of the opposition. You know, for the opposition, there's a show that everybody used to watch, and some guy used to say that winter is coming. For the NDP, winter is coming every single day. You know why? Because it drives them crazy that the economy and that the government is on the right track. She called putting money, she called cutting taxes and putting money back into the pockets of the people of Ontario a scheme. A scheme. So all of those people who are going to be getting money back in their pocket, it's a scheme. So when you go to work every single day, Order. you work really hard, you pay taxes, you raise your family, apparently according to the NDP, you're scheming. Earlier in question period, the Leader of the Opposition dared us to call an election. Now they're saying don't call an election. What is it? What you can do is this. What you can do is this. Support the policies Response. that have brought more jobs to Ontario. Support the policies that are bringing more transit, transportation. You were silent when we were building more. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The member for Ottawa Centre will come to order. The member for St. Catharines will come to order. The member for Sudbury will come to order. The next question. <laughs> the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Well, thank you, Mr. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Energy and Electrification. Minister, uh, families in my riding are struggling with rising costs. Life just gets getting more expensive, and many are worried about just getting by. When the Liberals were in charge, energy costs went way up. Families couldn't keep up, and sadly, many had to choose between eating or heating. Now the Trudeau Combi carbon tax is pushing prices even higher. Heating our homes, buying groceries and filling up at the gas station, everything costs more because of this regressive tax. On April the 1st, 2024, the Trudeau Crombie carbon tax went up another 23 per cent. Speaker, can the minister please tell us how our government is changing our energy policies along with the opposition to this unfair tax and how will that keep our energy affordable? Minister of Energy and Electrification. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore for being a strong champion for the people of Toronto. 
and a leader in our caucus who's standing up for affordability. Uh, you know, Mr. Speaker, this debate in the House today is most ironic. The leader of the opposition commenced her QP round talking about affordability. She must have missed the mark when we cut and extended the gas tax, saving five cents a litre for every single commuter in the province of Ontario. She must have missed the mark when we introduced the Affordable Energy Act to end the perilous policies of the Liberals that led to skyrocketing energy rates as we now will ensure affordability and competition is what informs every single energy procurement we make. She must have missed the mark when we went to the Supreme Court to litigate against the carbon tax that is now adding 20 cents a litre when it increases Response. for the fourth time in April. Our government is standing up for affordability. We've codified it in legislation and I urge the members opposite put their money where their mouth is the member for Hamilton West and the member for Waterloo will come to order supplementary question well, thank you. Thank you, Minister. You know, families in my riding are deeply concerned about the impact of rising energy costs on their daily lives. Many are already stretching every dollar to cover the basics like food and transportation and home heating. They remember the Liberal government's policies that led to soaring electricity bills, taking a big chunk out of their household budgets. Now Trudeau Crombie carbon tax is adding even more pressure. Each day, it increases and it's harder to keep up, whether it's for shopping for gas, groceries, or electricity. Families are asking for relief. They're not asking for added costs. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the Affordable Energy Act will help protect families, like the families in Etobicoke, from rising costs and provide a stable, affordable energy future? Here, here. Energy and electrification. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Yes, we must move forward with an affordable future for our children and grandchildren as we build out a vision for the province where we can deliver energy security for our industry, our farmers, and for our people. And we're doing that without imposing higher taxes on working families. Mr. Speaker, I want to take us back. Remember the days, the headlines at the CBC, Auditor General blasts Kathleen Wynne's fair hydro plan. The global news, billion dollar mistake, Ontario Liberals hijack plans for sustainable green power. The Globe, uh, part, saying Ontario's win, Ontario's win says she regrets handling electricity prices. Mr. Speaker, we have enough case studies that we know we can never go back to the reckless policies of higher energy and taxes under the Liberals, which is why the Premier has led the way with an Affordable Energy Act that codifies affordability, nuclear energy, mass expansion of conservation, and a commitment to Bonds. using technology, not taxation, to reduce emissions for the people of Ontario. Here, here. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, the fall, the Conservative fall economic statement won't deliver on Highway 69 again. For six years, the Conservative government has promised to finish four landing Highway 69, and for six years they failed. There's not a single kilometer, not a single shovel in the ground. They haven't even tendered a contract. When it comes to insider projects like a tunnel under the 401 or luxury spas, the Conservative government will move mountains. But when it comes to people dying on northern highways, the Conservative government makes excuses. My question, Speaker, is when will the Premier finally keep his promise to four-lane Highway 69? Thank you. Here, here. Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. This government has invested more in the North than any other government in previous history. When the former Liberal government for 15 years did absolutely nothing, the NDP sat back and cancelled projects like the Northlander. It's a shame, but this government under the Premier is investing, and that is why our government in June 2022 completed construction of an additional 14 kilometres of new lanes, Mr. Speaker. To date, 84 kilometres of Highway 69 has been expanded to four lanes, and we're going to continue to do that. But, Mr. Speaker, every single time on this House, when there has been a, uh, a vote on Highway 69 and the funding to support uh, more, uh, more construction, guess what, and design work, that member from Sudbury has voted against it every single he time, and that's a shame, too. Mr. Speaker. Our, Our speaker. government supports growth in the north. That member over there has voted against every single one of those investments, whether it's been highways, 11, 17, or 60, or whether it's been projects like the Northlander. That's a shame, Mr. Speaker, but we will always support the north and invest. Yeah, yeah. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, there has been zero legislation, zero effort on Highway 69. What he's saying isn't factual at all. The only thing they're good at constructing is excuses. <laughs> there you go. Like yeah. the Liberals. Ah, 
They have been promising it time and time again that they will complete this. The Liberals promised it for 15 years and broke the promise. The Conservatives started promising in 2018. They promised again in 2022. Keep breaking their promises. There's a pattern of over two decades of this government breaking promises to four-lane Highway 69. Meanwhile, Siberians keep dying. The question, the Premier first made his promise in 2018. It's 2024, six years later, will he finally keep his promise to four-lane Highway 69? I'm going to caution the member on his choice of words and his use of language. Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. That member sounds a bit defensive because that's all he can do right now, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, because if you look at the record, you can look at his record, he's voted against supporting growth in the north, whether that be the four-laning of the Highway 69 that he's asking about today, the design work, the expansion sure. of that project. Every single one of those is a part of our plan to build and expand uh, highways over the next 10 years for $27 billion. And what does that member do when he has a chance to support it? He votes against those projects. Projects, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to Highway 11, 17, whether it's been improvements to snow clearing, whether it's been improvements to making sure we invest to, uh, on the safety element of it, that member over there has voted against that, Mr. Speaker. And when this government has been put forward investments in the north, whether it be in mining or legislation and mining to help improve communities like Sudbury to get more growth up there, what does that member do? Whether it's highways, whether it's transit, or whether it's Response. investing in mining, that member for Sudbury votes against it every single time, and that's a shame. Thank you. The next question, the member for Don Valley North. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Speaker, this past Sunday, my family and I experienced a profound joy as we welcomed the arrival of my first grandchild. Child. <laughs> moments, moments like this show how significant and life-changing the gift our family truly is. Speaker, reflecting on this, I cannot help but, thinking, uh, but think of the many couples who are struggling to achieve this same joy due to the fertility challenges. For them, the path to parenthood is often complex, not only physically and emotionally, but also financially. Speaker, can the Minister of Health explain what this government is doing to support families who struggle with the financial burdens associated with the fertility uh, treatments in Ontario? Thank you, Speaker. Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and congratulations. While I am not looking forward to being a grandparent, I am very happy for your joy. You know, last week when the Minister of Finance and the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore, the Minister of Long-Term Care, and of course uh, the, the uh, member from Newmarket Aurora were able to visit an Etobicoke fertility clinic, clinic ReproMed, we saw directly what an investment this will mean and what an impact it will have on families. And I am incredibly proud of the investment that our government has been able to make through the fall economic statement, $150 million over two years to expand IVF for families who are desperately wanting to celebrate the expanding their family. It is indeed exciting news and very proud that our government was be able to do that. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister of Health for this encouraging news about increased funding for fertility treatments. I commend the government for its commitment to supporting families who dream of expanding and experiencing the joys of parenthood. For many Ontarians, the journey to becoming parents can be financially overwhelming, and this support demonstrates a meaningful step towards alleviating some of those burdens. Speaker, accessible support for fertility should be seen as part of this government's commitment to help all Ontarians realize their dreams of building a family. Speaker, can the minister provide additional information about how many Ontario families will be eligible to participate in the tax credit? Question. Thank you. Minister of Health. 
reduction to the $150 million over two years for specifically expanding IVF treatments. Uh, we also have a tax credit now available for families because there are often additional costs that are incurred when families are going through fertility treatments. And the fertility tax credit of $150 million means that families who want to expand their families are going to have that opportunity, and they have a government who has their back and is supporting them in that journey. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. The skilled trades offer a viable and rewarding career path for young people and job seekers in Ontario. Unlike the previous Liberal government that left behind a generational labour shortage in their wake, our government is creating more opportunities for people across the province to pursue a high-earning and fulfilling career in the trades. Speaker, we often hear the Minister talk about how we are breaking down the stigma around trades and building a strong workforce, but people in my riding want to hear about the personal impact of these changes. They want to know about the individual lives that have been changed as a result of this important work. Speaker, can the Minister please share with the House what he is hearing from workers, students and employers on the ground? The Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, thank you to the member for that question. What a champion of young men and women in the trades. I absolutely was thrilled to join her in Burlington. Thank you for the work you do. Um, Speaker, we're smashing the stigmas in the trades, and I want to tell you some stories. Uh, I'm going to start with Shiloh. We met him. Shiloh was bagging groceries. Thanks to our skills development fund and investments made to support him, he's now on his way to becoming a level two master carpenter. But I'm going to one-up that and tell you a story of Rock. Many on this side of the house know Rock well, and I think members on the other side as well. Um, Speaker, Rock, for me, Dreams do come true. Those are the words of Rock. She said um, she was one, the only woman, 350 men on a job site, the only black woman there. Well, that's changing, Speaker, because Rock is an inspiration. She stands tall as an inspiration to young women entering the trades. Let's talk stats. 30% increase in women registering into apprenticeships. That's because of this Premier. We're building a stronger Ontario. Thank you. And the supplementary question, back to the member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your response. These stories serve as powerful reminders of who we're fighting for, ensuring that our focus remains on improving lives of Ontarians. Speaker, every worker in Ontario deserves a fair, safe, and respectful work environment. I've spoken to workers and stakeholders in my riding who have concerns about the enforcement of new regulations in the skilled trade sector. We know that strong policies are only as strong and effective as their enforcement. That's why it's critical these rules are not just words on paper, but actively upheld in every workplace across Ontario. Speaker, could the Minister please share with the House how our government is supporting Ontario workers and cracking down on bad actors? Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I just want to continue briefly on Rock's story. Um, there's an incredibly empowering video of her outlining her story into the trades. And one of the things she talks about is health and safety. Speaker, we're working with our Prevention Council to ensure we're making incredible investments. You've seen it with the firefighters who visited this place on the retroactive cancer coverage. We continue to lead Canada on taking steps to both protect and honour our first responders, but investing in prevention. Uh, secondly, Speaker, our Employment Standards Act. This is an act that rarely was touched in the past. This Premier, if, with every working for workers, you know, we're almost as many working for workers as J.K. Rowling has Harry Potter novels, and we're going to keep doing it. Why? Because it's iterative. Investing and making changes to the Employment Standards Act, we have, we have investigators investing every uh, claim. Proactive investigations are up, Us. Speaker, and we're working with health and safety associations to make sure workers are safe on the job site as we build Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Hamilton West, and Pastor Dunn. My question is for the Minister of Health. This minister knows full well that home care patients across Ontario continue to suffer 
waiting for vital medical and pain supplies. But I do wonder, does this minister also know that home care workers are now forced to stretch the time in between changing bandages, catheters, and emptying drainage, and emptying drains? And they are reusing supplies that are no longer sterile, Ugh. drastically increasing the risk of life-threatening infections. Um, others, like my constituent Elizabeth Shaw, are buying their supplies from Amazon. So really, this has gone on long enough. You made this mess. It's time that you fixed it. Sir, remind the members to make your comments through the chair. Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. As I've said many times in this House and outside of this House, it is completely unacceptable when families, when patients are not able to get the critical supplies and medications that they need as they recover in their homes. That is why we have embedded special assistance teams with this particular vendor focused on ensuring that individuals who need those supplies are getting them in a very expedited manner. And I will say, as I have directed the Ontario Health at Home to do, uh, they have opened up a portal, a process to ensure that any patients, any families, any caregivers who went out and purchased these necessary supplies are getting reimbursed. And I can uh, share with the member opposite that as those uh, applications come in, they are being dealt with expeditiously. And in fact, over 80 percent have already had their uh, processes and refunds Response. issued. Thank you. The supplementary question. To the Minister of Health. It is unacceptable. I agree with you there, but it's gone on for almost two months. This needs to end now. Because in my riding, hospitals have loaned supplies, community members have donated leftover supplies and delivered them directly to agencies. My constituent, uh, Tom Swain, is helping his wife, Margaret, manage uh, lung cancer at home. He received a gift from a former home care patient who dropped off leftover provisions at his door, and his wife said uh, she had tears thinking about the kindness of strangers. The people of Hamilton are stepping up to help our sick and vulnerable people. When will this minister accept responsibility? You need to accept responsibility for this mess and do the same. Protect our vulnerable people in this province. Minister of Health. The member opposite is sharing the 1-866-377-7567 number to ensure that people know the process and how they can ensure that Order. their critical supplies are being delivered on schedule on time. And I have to say again to the Minister of Finance a thank you for the investments that not only happen in the 2023 budget of $1 billion in health care and community care, but of course in the 2024 budget, an additional $2 billion. These investments are now allowing us to ramp up and increase the number of individuals, 700,000 in the province of Ontario, who were not receiving community and home care previously, are now because of our investments. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question. The member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Solicitor General. Ontarians are deeply concerned about their safety. In communities across the province, families are worried. They hear about tragic cases where lives are lost because repeat offenders are allowed back into society after being granted bail time and again. Despite these clear and present dangers, the federal government has failed to act on bail reform. They've been slow to make changes that would protect our communities. Here in Ontario, we've done what we can to ensure safety. But the criminal code which controls bail rules is federal. We need the federal government to make these changes. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please explain what measures our government is advocating to the federal government to ensure that our communities are kept safe? Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my colleague and friend, who's such a strong advocate for public safety. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, when the Associate Minister and I went to Yellowknife, we couldn't have been more clear. That was to attend the federal, provincial, and territorial meeting. And we said some very simple things. 
that the other members, the other ministers of other provinces and territories supported, and that is that we must restore mandatory minimum sentencing for serious crimes, remove bail availability for violent offenders, and establish a three-strike-you're-out rule for repeat offenders. Mr. Speaker, there's only one government that has ever cared more about public safety. That's our government, led by Premier Ford. And Mr. Speaker, when the Liberals, who never started to do anything on public safety, our government will never stop. The supplementary question, back to the member for Renfrew, Nipissing-Pim. Speaker, and thank you to the Solicitor General for that answer. Families across Ontario are watching closely. They deserve to feel safe in their own neighbourhoods. They want to know that, what we're, that we're doing everything possible to keep violent offenders off the streets. Our police work hard each and every day, but they need our support. Ontario has been clear about the changes needed to protect our communities, yet we're still waiting for the federal government to act. Municipal leaders, police, families are asking for stronger laws, more resources and better coordination. Ontario's call for maximum pardon me, pardon me, call for mandatory minimums and stricter bail rules, but we can't make these changes alone. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please share what steps our government is taking to continue pressuring the Question. federal government to take immediate action on bail reform? The Solicitor General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The truth is. The Crombie and Trudeau Liberals just don't get it. They want more studies. They want to go back to wait for more conferences. We don't agree with this. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, we're never afraid to stand up against the criminals and put them behind bars where they belong. No matter the threat, no matter the odds, no matter the cost, our government, led by Premier Ford, will never stop. And we won't apologize for being tough on crime. We won't apologize for fighting auto theft. We won't apologize for standing up for the victims that have been, that have been dramatic, have their lives dramatically changed by being, by, by being attacked in the middle of the night in their own bedrooms. Mr. Speaker, there's a difference between us and them. The Liberals want to pander to response. The to the criminals, we won't. We will stand with the victims. The next question, the member for to Ms. Cochrane. My question is to the Minister of Finance. A uh, previous Conservative government downloaded miles of provincial highways to municipalities as a cost-cutting measure to them. Uh, former Municipal Highway 67 in Iroquois Falls is a good example. As a result of these downloaded highways and their costs, many of these municipalities, including Iroquois Falls, can't afford to provide basic services. So as a result, they're forced to make massive municipal tax increases. The province uploaded the Gardner and the DVP for Toronto. Will you do the same for municipalities like Iroquois Falls? And I'll ask the members to make their comments to the chair, Minister of Finance. Uh, I'll let uh, the Minister of Transportation and Highways take on the supplementary uh, part of that question, Mr. Speaker. Let me highlight first, though, a significant announcement made yesterday with the advocacy of the Minister of Housing and Municipal Affairs to provide support to uh, 320 small, more rural and north communities under the Ontario Municipal Partnership Fund. Mr. Speaker, that's going to increase $50 million next year on top of $500 million, and another $50 million the following year. That's a $100 million increase. That's going to help 320 communities right across Ontario. In fact, we're going through. This is going to be for many, many uh, communities, including your riding, right across Ontario, a big uh, help at a time when they need it for highways, Fonts. for infrastructure, for whatever they need in their communities, because we're supporting communities right across Ontario. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister of Finance for that question, for that response. So, 50 million over 320 municipalities. It costs almost a half a million dollars on average to replace a kilometer of two-lane highway in this province. So that doesn't even do that doesn't even do a half a kilometer on 67. 
have a, but, but they can't afford, they can't afford to provide services now. So why don't you actually take back the highways that you downloaded? You recognized it for yeah, Toronto, back. you recognized it for Toronto, but you refuse to recognize it for the rest of the province. There's massive, you claim that there are no tax increases under the Conservative government. What you're down doing is downloading the tax increases yeah. to the municipalities. Exactly. That's what you're doing. Yeah. Take back those highways. Thank you. Members, you please take them seat. And I'll remind members to make their comments through the chair. Order. Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Let's look at the record here, Mr. Speaker. There's only one party in this province that supports building highways and roads, Mr. Speaker. We heard not too long ago, a couple months ago, uh, the federal Liberal Environment Minister say there is no more money for roads. He doesn't want to build roads anywhere in this country or this province. We know the needs of the North, Mr. Speaker. We know the infrastructure needs of the North, and that's why we have dedicated over $28 billion over the next 10 years to build the roads, to build the highways across this province, especially in the North, recognizing the challenges that we have in the North over there. But let's be clear, those members, anytime they've had an opportunity to vote to support highways in the North, have stood up time and time again, whether it be Highway 11, 17, support the municipalities, or, uh, Mr. Speaker, in fact, uh, the, 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 the budget that we have, the fall economic statement that we have uh, put forward today, have refused to support every single one of those investments. So, as a government, we... Thank you very much. Continuing on, we've got the member for Richmond Hill next. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Long-Term Care, who cares about the seniors just as much as I do. Ontario seniors deserve access to services and support they need to enjoy a high quality of life. When I speak to families in my riding of Richmond Hill, I often hear that they are concerned about their loved ones having a place to call home as they age. As our senior population continues to grow at a rapid rate, we must ensure that they have the critical infrastructure needed to support them. Speaker, the previous Liberal government failed to understand the importance of investing in long-term care. In contrast, our government has made record investments in building and redeveloping long-term care homes across the province. Question. Speaker, can the Minister please share what actions our government has taken to ensure that our seniors have a place called home? The Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you much, Speaker. Speaker, it is my honour to rise today and answer my very first question as Ontario's Minister of Long-Term Care. And I want to thank the Premier for putting his trust in me and giving me this honour of a lifetime. And to the member from Richmond Hill, she is correct. We both indeed care for our seniors, including those living in long-term care. Speaker, I have had a very busy and productive summer touring our beautiful province to check in with the sector and ensure that we are on track. I participated in groundbreakings and toured construction site, a testament to our progress of building thousands more homes, not merely beds, but homes. I visited colleges and universities to talk to our brilliant students and let them know that long-term care is hiring. And I visited residents, staff, and caregivers in no less than 52 homes wow. to hear their voices directly and ensure they are reflected in our policies. Response. And, Speaker, I'm happy to report the long term care sector is growing and thriving in the province of Ontario with hundreds of shovels in the ground on capital projects and thousands more new staff joining our long term care workforce. Yeah. Supplementary question. Thank you very much, Minister. I know that our government's action will provide peace of mind for seniors and their families in my riding of Richmond Hill. Speaker, Ontario seniors have worked hard to build up our province to what it is today. They deserve our continued support and commitment. That's why we must ensure that long-term care homes have the resources they need to provide residents with high-quality care. Speaker, can the minister please explain what actions our government has taken to improve the quality of life for residents in long-term care? 
Minister of Long-Term Care. The member makes a great point, and as a nurse, I care deeply about the quality of care our residents receive. When the member and I visited Mackenzie Health in her riding and we toured the home, we spoke to the nurses, the PSWs, and the nurse practitioner about the impacts that our investments are having today, right now. The PSWs told us how their resident ratios have improved, where in the past they would have to take care of 10 to 12 residents, today their ratios are closer to six. The nurses told us about the new equipment like bladder scanners, IV pumps, glucometers they are able to access thanks to our equipment and training fund. And the nurse practitioner told us about the impact their presence has in the long-term care home, providing clinical guidance, expertise and education to other staff. In a nutshell, Speaker, our investments are working. They are improving the quality of care for our residents and job satisfaction for our staff. Yeah, yeah. The next question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, Heather lives in London West and just started volunteering at her son's elementary school. She told me that 50 to 70 kids are coming to school hungry every single day. She knows that kids who are hungry cannot learn, so she applied to the Ontario School Nutrition Program. Unfortunately, she was told that there is no funding available because there are already 30 schools on the wait list in the Southwest region, including 13 schools in London Middlesex. Speaker, parents like Heather want this government to get the basics right. They had an opportunity in the fall economic statement to invest in student nutrition programs. Will the Premier explain to Heather why there is money for luxury spas and fantasy tunnels, but teachers and parent volunteers have to fundraise to make sure that kids are fed? The parliamentary assistant member for Markham Unionville. A healthy meal goes a long way to ensure that students are set up for success. Absolutely. I'm proud of work we are doing alongside with MCCSS to ensure that over $28 million annually for the student nutrition programs here, here. continues to reach the students that did it most. This program helps to ensure that students can stay fully engaged and focus on our updated STEM-focused curriculum. Speaker, the student nutrition programs helps to further complement my ministry's investments of over, over 58 million in student safety and well-being right. initiatives in schools. Together, this investment helps ensure students can learn in a safe and healthy environment. We know that student nutrition program, which provides meals and snacks to students, nearly 70% of our publicly funded schools, must continue. And I look forward to working with my colleagues as MCCSS as we Response. support students across the province. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, students who are hungry cannot learn, period. Kids need access to healthy, nutritious food, and they need it through the school nutrition program. Speaker, this government has had six years to properly fund school nutrition. It provides less funding than almost every other province in Canada. Under this Premier's watch, the number of students going to class hungry has gotten bigger every single year, as the rising cost of groceries leaves more and more families struggling to feed their kids. Speaker, can the Premier tell Heather and so many other Ontario parents why making sure that kids have access to nutritious food is not a priority for his government. And to reply, the Minister, Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Let me make it very clear to my colleagues uh, in opposition. Every child and every youth is our priority in this province, hey, Mr. Speaker, right. which is why we invested more than $6.15 million in the program last year, Mr. Speaker, which is why we partnered with many, because the spirit of the student nutrition program involves municipalities, the private sector. We initiated with this minister here, Mr. Speaker, the Healthy Students Brighter Ontario campaign with our partners, which increased support by more than $7.1 million again, on top of the $6.15 million, Mr. Speaker. 
Why? Because we want to make sure the children and youth that are going to school, Mr. Speaker, have access to the breakfast, snacks, and lunches. And I wrote a letter last year to my federal counterpart, asked them to step up and support up. our Come efforts on. to Bob. make sure no child or youth in this province ever goes hungry, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. The member for Nickel Belt has informed me she has a point of order. Point of order, Speaker. I wish to correct my record. Yesterday, the member from Kuitanung asked me uh, if uh, the chief had been consulted for the transportation of radioactive material. I misidentified uh, her. Her name is Patsy Corbier. She is Ujima K of Ondek Oni Kaning, as well as the tribal chair of the United Chiefs of Council of Minidu. Uh, menacing. Uh, I misidentified uh, her yesterday and I wanted to correct my record. Thank the member for Nicola. It's entirely in order to correct your record. Thank you so much. Member for Kitchener Centre has a point of order. Hi, I'd just like to wish everyone here and the people of my riding a happy Diwali and a happy Halloween. Enjoy your day. Thank you very much. There being no further business this morning, this House stands in recess until 1 p.m. <laughs>